Well, here we are at the end of the course. This is our last lecture. We began back in lecture one with the historical roots of cosmology. And since then, we've traveled to all manner of places, out to the visible horizon and back to the beginning of time. And now our journey is over. We've arrived back here at the place we started, here on Earth in the human world. And I want to spend this last lecture exploring two themes that, each in their own way, weave the cosmological realm and the human realm into a single thread. In the first theme, I want to bring the remarkable phenomenon of human understanding into the cosmological story. Basically, how can something that emerges out of the atoms and forces of nature, ourselves, ultimately come to understand such a vast and alien realm. Phrased a little bit more poetically, how can the universe understand itself? The second theme, I want to start from the fact that traditional creation stories have always played an important role in human cultures. The question is, can our modern cosmological story play a similar role in modern society, with a strong emotional, poetic, and even spiritual dimension. Now, before I launch into these two themes, I need to make the obvious point that I'm going to be walking well outside my own area of expertise. After all, I'm neither a psychologist or a sociologist, nor a philosopher or a theologian, all of whom may, in one way or another, think about similar kinds of questions. But I feel these are sufficiently important themes that we really shouldn't ignore them in a course of this kind. So just please accept that these are going to be my own reflections and hopefully they may at least give you some food for thought. So let's begin with that first theme or question, which I think is nicely summarized by Einstein's famous quote, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Einstein was puzzled about why nature yielded to our understanding. Now, in our cosmological context, we might rephrase the question in slightly simpler terms. Why can our minds, which have been constructed in this tiny and extremely unusual corner of the universe, somehow grasp and understand utterly alien processes that are unimaginably remote in space and time? But of course, that's just the point. They are imaginable. In fact, at times the cosmological story has seemed almost too familiar to be credible. For example, do you remember in Lecture 13 that the young universe shifted through rainbow-coloured skies and evolving harmonic sounds? Now, even allowing for the fact that I tend to cast things in human terms, doesn't that situation sound suspiciously just a bit too close to being humanly recognizable. This bizarre level of familiarity raises a rather depressing possibility. That our apparent comprehension of the universe may in fact be an illusion. Somehow, both the intuitive and scientific descriptions of the universe are so deeply human that they reflect more our inner imaginative world than the outer objective world. In other words, maybe we are making the universe in our own image. Well, although there may be some truth to this, I want to explore a different perspective that suggests we can in fact have an authentic comprehension of nature and actually why we might expect to find familiar things in extremely remote places and times. Now this perspective starts from a very simple fact. The world we experience is not the real external world, but instead it's a reconstruction of the external world inside our heads. Just take in your surroundings for a moment. Right now, the TV, my voice, whatever else is in the room, it all feels so clearly to be out there but it isn't. The image you're looking at and the sound you're hearing right now are in fact located deep within your head. They've been reconstructed by your brain using information sent by your eyes and ears. 
Now, of course, there really is a TV out in front of you, and there really are sound waves coming from it. But you never perceive these directly. You're always one step removed. We all live in, we all inhabit our own reconstruction of the external world. Now, this rather profound truth has some wonderful implications for how we might be able to understand nature. Let's first ask how this situation of brains making representations of external reality might have come about. It's actually not too difficult to see how, as long as you view us, and pretty much any organism with senses, as having gradually evolved in the classic Darwinian sense, by adaptive evolution. Basically, for organisms to survive and thrive in a complex environment, they must develop senses and a brain that together build an accurate replica of the outside world. This replica is then rapidly and automatically perceived so that the organism can act appropriately and thrive. Now, in order for this all to work at all, there must be a pretty good correspondence between the inner replica world and the external real world. Otherwise, of course, we'd walk off cliffs or into the mouths of predators. So, and this is the important part, because of this match between the external and internal worlds, many of nature's real physical qualities get brought into our inner world, where, over millions of years, we've developed an intuitive understanding of them. Now, although this explains why we have an intuitive understanding of our local environment, how can this understanding extend well off the Earth and into the cosmic realm? The answer is that the laws of nature permeate the universe, rather like space itself. And even our unusual little terrestrial corner contains a lot that is cosmically uh, relevant. So let me give you a few examples of how evolution in our own terrestrial, local world has equipped us to grasp the remote, cosmic world. So right off the bat, evolution has occurred on a stage made from simple Newtonian space and time. And this is essentially identical to 99% of cosmic space and time, from the nanometer world to the million light year world. So, our ability to feel and sense location, distance, size, shape, speed, and so on, all crucial to survival, provides us with a toolkit of intuition that is adequate to grasp many of the geometric and dynamic qualities of stars and galaxies, as well as cells and molecules. As we move through our daily environment, we're also constantly experiencing forces, pressures, energies, temperatures, gravity. Things fall and accelerate and do damage when they hit the ground. These basic components of classical mechanics are carried into our internal world, where our brains have evolved to intuit them sufficiently well that we can later grasp, ease fairly easily, for example, that gravity causes gas clouds to collapse, which compress and heat to become stars, which cook one element into another. Now, at this point, I should mention at least two limits to this idea. The first is that there are, of course, some very important aspects of nature that are really absent from our perceived world. And so we have genuine gaps in our ability to intuit them. The two classic examples are curved space-time and quantum effects, which are famously difficult, if not impossible, to feel intuitively, and they only yield to our understanding when we cast them in more abstract mathematical ways. In this case, using general relativity and, and quantum mechanics. That brings us to me to, me to the, uh, the second limit. Obviously, our ability to fully understand nature, both local and cosmic, needs more than just an inner replica world. I mean, after all, most animals do that just as well as we do. We need additional powers of cognition and abstraction. Now, quite why we have somehow developed these higher capabilities is a much less obvious, though, personally, 
um, I would not be surprised if they also had an evolutionary origin. Perhaps not selected for directly, but as a byproduct of selection in some other area. For example, the need to navigate the extremely complex human and pre-human social environment. But my main point is that the foundation for understanding nature is in place. An interior replica world of the outer natural world. And this provides the bedrock on which higher, more analytic capacities can focus. And furthermore, much of what we meet here on Earth is, in one way or another, out there in the universe. So let me give you a few more examples of just this. Let's think about light. How well has our terrestrial environment prepared us to understand the ele electromagnetic component of the universe? The answer is really very well indeed. We've evolved on the surface of a planet illuminated by a very ordinary star, the sun. So it's no surprise that our eyes and the eyes of all other animals are sensitive just to a terribly narrow range of colours in the optical part of the spectrum that is precisely the range emitted by the 6,000 degree hot glowing surface of the sun. Obviously, animals that can use that light to witness their environment, as opposed to being blind, have a significant advantage. And it's because of this that eyes that can see sunlight have evolved. Now, additionally, our planet rotates, plunging us into darkness half the time. So those eyes must also be sensitive enough to function under moonlight and starlight. So, our partially nocturnal evolution explains, prior to any understanding whatever, why we can feel familiar with the existence of stars. Of course, our experience of the sun transfers to other stars, and taken together, you can see why at least the stellar content of the universe is at least intuitively accessible to us. But the topic actually goes much deeper than this. The reason that a star's surface, or photosphere, is a few thousand degrees and producing light is because this is the temperature below which electrons remain attached to atoms. Inside the star, it is hot and foggy, and light is trapped. But at its surface, the gas becomes transparent, allowing light to escape into space. Now, does this sound familiar? Because it should. It's exactly the same situation we met in Lecture 13, for the young universe, which cools down from a hot, glowing fog and clears when it reaches a few thousand degrees, setting the light free that ultimately becomes the microwave background. In fact, the microwave background is sometimes called the cosmic photosphere to remind us how similar it is to a star's photosphere. So, are we falsely humanizing creation when we describe the young universe as having skies of blue or green or yellow? No, it's our evolution under sunlight and the ubiquity of photospheres that immediately allows us to recognize and feel home with, at home with the colours of the young universe. Let's push this further. What about those primordial sounds? These, more than anything, seem just too familiar to be credible. In fact, we were all taught in high school that above our atmosphere, sound isn't possible, and space is always silent. But this is true only if you demand human ears to hear sound. In fact, Almost everywhere in the universe, you'll find a dilute gas of some kind, and more likely than not, it's being pushed one way or another by something, and in response to those pushes, pressure waves move. This happens inside stars, through stellar winds, across galaxies. Sound waves move. And they also move, of course, in planetary atmospheres, where they carry enough information to guarantee that Evolving organisms will find ways to hear them. So our experience of sound, arising from evolution within the Earth's atmosphere, immediately allows us to grasp an enormous range of cosmic pressure waves, including those moving in the hot, thin 
atmosphere of the young universe. OK, but what about the harmonics? Why should anything like a musical instrument exist back then? Well, remember that harmonics arise when anything of fixed size or age vibrates. So in a sense, nature is actually filled with musical instruments, caves, animal voices, atoms, planets, stars, and even the young universe. They all vibrate with sets of harmonics. Now, I'm speculating here, but I suspect that it's our voice cavity and the evolution of language that's resulted in our sensitivity to harmonics and possibly even the creation of music and musical instruments. Once again, our evolution in a natural, physical world brings its qualities into our senses and then into our minds. Sound and harmonics are just two more of these qualities which we can immediately recognize when we find them out in the cosmic realm. So we began this theme by worrying whether we had made the universe in our own image, projecting our inner human world out onto our cosmology. But now it seems as though things are the other way around. It's the universe that has, in a sense, made us in its own image. Evolution generates organisms with an inner experiential world that corresponds quite well to the outer objective world. And this correspondence guarantees that if these organisms develop sentience, they can comprehend nature in both intuitive and abstract ways. Also, since evolution occurs across, excuse me, occurs in a cosmic context on a planetary surface under an ordinary star, and since nature's laws permeate the entire universe, then our terrestrially evolved brains are in fact reasonably well equipped to construct a rich and accurate cosmological story in which even remote parts can seem surprisingly familiar. This, I think, is an utterly wonderful notion that nature, by allowing us to evolve on her own stage, has ensured that we are also able to speak her language and comprehend her play, not just close to home, but throughout her realm, from atom to galaxy, from cosmic dawn to the emergence of life. This idea has, I think, enormous emotional appeal as well as intellectual appeal. And this brings me to the second theme for this lecture, which is to ask whether modern cosmology can provide the kind of emotional messages that traditional creation stories have always done. Just think of the many roles traditional creation stories play. They help us to understand our place in a large and often hostile world. They help connect us to nature and the gods. They can make us feel special and chosen. And they can even include a moral component that helps us live out our lives wisely. So can modern cosmology provide at least some of these qualities? My own view is that it can. Now to begin thinking about this, it's useful, I think, to reflect on how today's society tends to view nature itself and our scientific exploration of nature. My impression is that nature, particularly non-biological nature, is for the most part viewed in non-emotive, impersonal terms. I mean, atoms and rocks are just there. Perhaps they evoke curiosity, or they can be exploited in some way, but fundamentally, nature is inanimate, an it rather than a thou. As for scientific inquiry and discourse, Unfortunately, I think for many people, though certainly not all, science can be perceived in negative ways. It's inaccessible or intimidating or cold and rational and is even seen sometimes to rob nature of its mystery. But it's interesting that this is only a relatively recent way of viewing nature or science. Historians have written extensively on how attitudes to nature have changed over time and throughout most of human history and across most cultures, there have been quite different ways of looking at the natural world. Often, for example, there's a pervasive sense of animism. 
Nature is almost alive, or at least has agency. Maybe it's maternal and nurturing, or perhaps hostile and destructive. And quite generally, nature is viewed with reverence and respect, a sense that it is older than us and will be here after we're gone. And this gives it a status that is essentially divine. So what qualities might we look for in modern cosmology that could reconnect us to nature in the kind of ways that traditional creation myths have done in the past? Perhaps the most obvious qualities will be those that inspire awe and reverence. These are present in great abundance. In fact, pretty much every subplot of the story, every lecture in this course, has something that is just stunning in its power or speed or enormity, or minuteness. As telescopes improve, we just continue to be amazed at the beauty and majesty of the galaxies, or nebulae, or almost everything we look at. So the capacity to inspire awe and reverence is undoubtedly present in modern cosmology. But to my mind, feelings of awe and reverence are not the key emotions we're looking for in a creation story. They're just a little bit too highbrow. By far, the kinds of emotions with the most currency for humans are ones of relationship, and even more so, kinship and lineage. We really are built to respond to these themes. So it's not surprising that most creation stories, and most stories in general, are framed in terms of relationships and connections to families, to ancestors, to enemies, to the gods. And because of this, they have an immediate resonance with us. We feel their message much more vividly. So can we find opportunities to feel connection and kinship in modern cosmology? I think the answer is, yes, we can, as long as we choose to cast things that way, a bit like I've tried to do in these lectures. Just think back over them. In lectures 23 and 24, we found a deep connection to the stars. In a sense, we're descended from them, since our atoms were made inside them. But they were also dependent on us, since making our atoms allowed them to stay alive and keep shining. So knowing this, we can look differently at the stars in the sky. We can feel connected to them. They are, in a sense, our kin. We can also feel a much broader sense of lineage to atomic matter in general. It's only one of the five cosmic components. Like five very different family clans, the others are alien and mysterious with very different customs and practices. For example, we can feel no immediate connection with dark energy. It's ghostly and aloof. But the gas making the sound waves in the young universe that's our stuff. That's our clan. We know its nature intimately because ultimately it becomes us. In the same way that here on Earth we can expand our sense of kinship from family to nation to mankind and even to the environment, so we can expand our sense of kinship with the other components of the universe. So as we learned in Lecture 33, we were all created out of gravity during inflation. We all have a common ancestor. We were all, we're all essentially the same stuff, energy. Our energy just happens to be locked up in matter. We can even forge a connection to the microsecond old universe by remembering that the energy of the cooling fireball got locked away inside matter at that time. Take your hand and look at it. In your mind's eye, unlock that energy briefly, a hydrogen bomb inside your fist, and right there you have the microsecond old universe. It's there in your hand, in modified form, locked away from a time when everywhere had that incandescence. Perhaps the greatest sense of kinship I introduced a few minutes ago. Evolving within nature has shaped our intuition in such a way that we can understand the cosmological story. It's almost as if we're nature's children, born speaking her language. With this new sense of kinship can come a feeling of love 
for the universe and a feeling of being at home in it. This is, of course, nothing new. People have felt bonded to nature um, in all ages, often via spirits or gods. But my point is that one can maintain these feelings within a more modern, essentially secular, cosmological paradigm. Now, something that is obvious from all these examples is that we are, is that the relationships we have are with inanimate things. Atoms and galaxies are not, after all, conscious things. But one of the more powerful and appealing aspects of many creation myths is that they are human, excuse me, is that there are human or superhuman characters in the story. So this raises an interesting question of whether or not one could ever recast modern cosmology in anthropomorphic terms. One way to do this would be to follow the long tradition of telling creation stories in an epic or poetic narrative form. Now, I hesitate to flesh this idea out too much because I really don't know how it might look. But if you think back over the lectures, you'll find many wonderful episodes and possible characters to consider who might really bring such a narrative alive. Just think of the nature of dark matter and the role it plays in commanding where our own atomic matter must go. Or think of light's Herculean power in the young universe and its gradual loss of strength as the universe expands. Or think of the late entrance of dark energy and its insidious effect on galaxy gathering. Really, the cast of characters is long and their personalities are wonderfully varied. In some ways, we're no different from any other culture at any other time. We want to feel nourished by a story told in human terms of how the world came to be here, of how we came to be here, of what our ultimate ancestry is. Such stories have played out their nurturing role century after century and in culture after culture. And I think there's really no reason why our own modern cosmological story can't play that same role today. So in the absence of any contemporary cosmological narrative, I'm going to close this lecture and this course with a poetic expression of the deep connection we have with nature, one that was written in 1687 by the English poet John Dryden. It's the first verse of a poem called A Song for St. Cecilia's Day, and it celebrates St. Cecilia, the patron saint of music, and supposedly the creator of the organ. Now, of course, the poem isn't scientifically schooled, and it has a rather different agenda to ours, but it picks as its central theme something we've talked about many times in these lectures, the primacy of sound and its role in creation. I hope you like it. From harmony, from heavenly harmony, this universal frame began. When nature underneath a heap of jarring atoms lay and could not heave her head, the tuneful voice was heard from high, Arise ye more than dead. Then cold and hot and moist and dry in order to their stations leap and music's power obey. From harmony, from heavenly harmony, this universal frame began. From harmony to harmony, through all the compass of the notes it ran, the diapason closing full in man. <laughs>